We will suspend. We will resume. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, we will suspend. Regrettably, we are going to have to clear the I am very, very sorry, but we, re we require to clear the gallery at this point. Moment. We will clear the gallery at the moment. There will be a suspension.
Thank you, colleagues. Um, I don't think I can adequately express my deep regret that such action is required in our national parliament. Um, and, you know, I'm extremely sorry for the overwhelming majority of those who have travelled to the Parliament today to watch their elected representatives at work. Um, I am pleased that we've been able to continue to accommodate our young people here. And while we continue to focus on a swift solution to this, we will see what we can do in terms of targeting any response. But for today, I think given that we'd had five disruptions, it's essential that we do all we can to protect the well-being and safety of those who expect to come to this parliament and quietly watch the parliament at its work. Now, um, a, a point, well, is it? <laughs> I, I, it's very unusual that we take points of order during First Minister's questions. I will on this occasion, Mr Macmillan. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, uh, I absolutely agree with your, your comments and your sentiments. There are some young people remaining in the gallery, which I welcome. But there also are some young people, particularly the school from my constituency, who have travelled from Guruk to be here today, and they are now no longer in the public gallery. But there will be other young people who are out of the gallery. I would, I would genuinely request that we can get the, all the young people back in because they have done nothing wrong. Thank you. I am content if members are to wait for a few minutes to see what we can do to accommodate those who, who have been caught up in the disruption. So can I suggest we just suspend for a few more minutes and we enable our colleagues in security to see what can be done in that regard. Thank you. <clears throat> Douglas Ross. Can I have Douglas Ross's microphone, please? If they got into the mic system, I was just walking away, that was going to be it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, uh, and I respect uh, everything you've tried to do, presiding officer, but this shower have been doing this week after week after week, and the image of genuine constituents being forced out of our parliament is one we will all regret and one none of us want to see repeated. I am very grateful that young people have been able to stay, but we must do something to stop this going forward. Um, and if I remember correctly, because it was some time ago, the First Minister was trying to criticise me for my questions and, and some of the things I was saying uh, in question three. They were all direct quotes from his own party members, even some of his own MSPs. They were criticising his ability to turn around the economy. Hamza Youssef is leading a divided party that has got no confidence in his government's ability. Uh, and it's no wonder why. He's stuffed his cabinet full of his predecessor's lackeys, ministers with almost poor a track record in government uh, as he has. 
more ministers than ever before, yet he managed to appoint just one that didn't support him in the leadership election. He squeaked a win and then forced the former finance secretary, Kate Forbes, and her supporters out of government in an act of petty vengeance. And now, to shore up his position within his feuding party, he's back pushing independence because it's the only thing that unites the SNP. Hamza Youssef is more divisive than even Nicola Sturgeon was. He's already split his party down the middle, and now he wants to do the same with the country. In these difficult times, Scotland needs a government focused on the real priorities of people across Scotland and the big challenges we face. Yet instead, we have one that is at war with itself and focused on engineering further division. If young Hamza Youssef cannot even unite his own party, how can he possibly unite the country? First Minister. I say, uh, first of all, foremost, uh, President Officer, I do agree with the action you've taken. I'm delighted the young people were allowed to stay and can I commend the young people uh, for behaving much better than some of the adults uh, yeah, that were yeah, uh, yeah. in the public uh, gallery. Um, can I say on, on Douglas Ross's criticism of the economic literacy of this government, of this uh, SNP-led government, let me remind them, of course, that SNP, uh, under the SNP, under uh, Nicola Sturgeon, under John Swinney, and I'm pleased to be building on this legacy, that Scottish GDP grew more than UK GDP. Can I also, of course, make the point that if we had listened to Douglas Ross, who demanded that we copy Liz Truss's tax cuts for the wealthiest, we would have had over £500 million less Absolutely. to spend to invest in public services. Thank God we did not listen uh, to them. I am building upon a legacy where we have higher unemployment, lower unemployment, low uh, economic inactivity. And as for division, they are a party, the Conservatives, that tore themselves apart over Brexit. The Tory party has had more leaders in as many months than Douglas Ross has jobs, presiding officer. Yeah. This coming division, coming from a man who said that if he was Prime Minister for one day, the only thing he would do would be to hammer the rights of one of the most marginalised communities in the country. So I'll take no lessons on division from Douglas Ross. I am delighted to have appointed a cabinet and a ministerial team that will build upon the legacy that Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney have left us. It makes us the most popular party in Scotland. It makes us the national party of Scotland. We will work every single day to earn and re-earn that trust. But it is because we focus on the priorities of the people of Scotland that we are going to continue, I am certain, to be the most popular party in this country. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President officer, the new First Minister has uh, lots to get to grip with, so I thought it's only fair that we should start with something he should already be across. Uh, there is a mental health crisis affecting children across Scotland, but they are struggling to access treatment. During Hamza Yusuf's time as Health Secretary, more than 11,000 children and young people waited more than the 18-week standard for treatment. Shockingly, over 14,000 had the referral for mental health treatment rejected entirely. So will the First Minister take this opportunity to offer an apology to the children and families he let down as Health Secretary? First Minister. Can I say, as has become customary, of course, when Anna Sawar asks these questions, he does not acknowledge the impact, of course, of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. A global pandemic, which has been the biggest shock of the NHS and its 74-year existence. Yeah. Of course, anybody that has been let down, particularly our children and young people, I not only offer an apology, I offer deep regret for anybody that has had to wait longer. I would not want my loved one, I would not want my children, if they ever needed those services, to have to wait any longer than they should. But we are taking action on recovery. I am taking action on recovery. For example, when we look at CAMS, when we look at the number of young people waiting to be seen for their mental health, the number of children starting treatment from CAMS in the most recent quarter is the highest figure on record. The last four quarters, in fact, have seen each of the four highest figures on record for the number of children starting treatment for CAMS. So I agree with Anna Sawa. There are too many young people waiting too long, but this uh, action 
the recovery that we have made, the recovery that will now be led, and I will of course lead that from government, but led uh, by the Cabinet Secretary for NHS recovery, uh, for the NHS and for social care, we will make sure that we continue to invest in that. Let me end by saying that uh, it is because of our progressive taxation, presiding officer, that we are able to invest a record £19 billion in our health service, and I hope we continue to make improvements in relation to young people waiting for camps. Anna Sarwar. The First Minister can't use the pandemic for this excuse because they've never met in 16 years their CAM standard. So no excuse of the pandemic on this one. Because incompetence has consequences. Behind these statistics are struggling children and heartbroken families. Here's just one example. Ten-year-old Alan Gilbraith. He has been waiting for his mental health treatment to start the entire time Hamza Youssef was health secretary. And here's what Robert's dad, told, sorry, uh, Alan's dad, Robert, told us. He is really up and down. He will have days where you won't get a word out of him. We don't know what's happened unless something goes wrong. I feel like he's just been left. It doesn't matter what happens with him. There's been an array of cancelled appointments. We expected them to give Alan a diagnosis, maybe start treatment, something to help, but there's been nothing. All we get when we phone is that we're sorry. I cannot even begin to understand why Alan has gone from ready to start medication to the back of the queue, especially when it's a matter of mental health, and I really fear what, for what further delay will mean for him. We just feel constantly let down. We are very aware of the pandemic, but there is just not an answer, all while my son and my family are suffering. Health Secretary Hamza Youssef failed this family. Why will First Minister Hamza Youssef be any different? First Minister. Can I say that, of course, on the individual case that Anna Sauer references, I'm more than happy to receive the details and see if there's any way that we can assist uh, Alan and, of course, uh, assist uh, his family as well. Uh, let me say uh, once again, I am the first and have been when I was Health Secretary to acknowledge that, of course, there are challenges and there were challenges pre the pandemic. But anybody uh, who, of course, and all of us have lived through the last few years, will acknowledge that the impact of the global pandemic has been felt, of course, in our health service here in Scotland, but in health services right across the UK, and I would say uh, right across the world. And our recovery is starting to see improvement. If I look at the latest, uh, if I look at the latest figures, uh, overall CAMS waiting lists have decreased by a reduction of around about 777 people. Children waiting over 18 weeks has decreased by 1,110. Children waiting over 52 weeks have decreased by 523. That's a 41.9% reduction. And the number of people recruited to CAMS uh, at, a, at a record high under this government and under uh, my tenure as Health Secretary. But all of that, I fully accept, will be cold comfort to Alan, uh, Robert, uh, and their family. So I'm more than happy to look at this individual case, uh, but we are on the road to recovery, not just on our health service, but on our mental health services too. Yeah, yeah. Anna Sarwar. Presenting officer, Alan was waiting the entire time Hamza Youssef was health secretary. Let that sink in. A young child needing desperate help from our NHS, having to wait the entire time Hamza Youssef was health secretary. No hiding behind any pandemic, no hiding behind the statistics in that book. That is families suffering right across this country. And it's not just two years of SNP failure, it's 16 years of SNP failure. This government has never, never met their 18 week CAM standard. And when Hamza Youssef was health secretary, Labour repeatedly called for a new referral system so that no young person is rejected for treatment that every GP practice has a dedicated mental health worker and a mental health a and &E in every health board so that patients can be fast-tracked, but they failed to listen. So why can't the First Minister see that for children like Alan and their families, incompetence has consequences, continuity won't cut it, and more of the same isn't going to improve their lives? First Minister. Can I again... Um say to Anna Sawar that I am not suggesting and have never suggested that there weren't challenges pre-pandemic. Equally, I, suppose, I, I, I accept uh, and I hope he accepts that the global pandemics and the impact of that uh, have been significant, not just on our NHS, uh, but of course on mental health services uh, as well. We know that local authorities report that between January uh, and June 2022, more than 38,000 young people and families 
access over 230 new and enhanced community-based mental health support. Now, why do I mention that? Because CAMS is, of course, important. But our, our, our interventions, our investments in early intervention are extremely important as well. I take the point also made uh, about rejected uh, referrals, and that's why we've accepted uh, the recommendations of the report uh, in relation to rejected uh, uh, referrals and the audit that took place uh, in 2018. So I expect to continue to see progress uh, in that regard. Uh, when statistics covering quarter one of 2023 are released uh, later this year in June, we're confident that a number of boards will have made significant progress in meeting the standard of 90% of young people seen by CAMS. Uh, uh, we know that health services right across the UK have been impacted by the global pandemic. What are we doing about it? Not just making sure that we make right by the recovery of the NHS, but ensuring that we invest a record £19 billion in our health service in 23-24. What else are we doing? We're making sure, and of course I led in this as Health Secretary, that our NHS staff are the best paid here than anywhere else in the UK. And that's why, of course, I'm pleased that we've never lost a single day this winter to strike action, which is very different to other countries across the UK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question number three, Liz Smith. Can I have Liz Smith's microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, to ask the First Minister, in light of last week's uh, fiscal sustainability report published by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, what the economic priorities of the Scottish Government are. First Minister. The report highlights the impact of long-term change in demographics to our economy and public finances, but we're experiencing those challenges now as business and public services struggle to recruit and retain staff. There's simply no doubt that Brexit and the loss of freedom of movement has exacerbated these challenges. Uh, Scotland has distinct economic needs, so the UK Government must give us a formal role in deciding which occupations are on the shortage occupation list. The National Strategy for Economic Transformation sets out the actions we are taking. Economic success, of course, is not just GDP growth, but delivering a well-being economy, which will increase productivity and international competitiveness and deliver fairer, greener prosperity for all of Scotland. We're doing everything possible within the powers currently available, but we need the full powers of independence to truly unleash and maximise Scotland's potential. Liz Smith. First Minister, this report paints an extremely gloomy picture of the Scottish economy, most especially in terms of our weaker productivity, our demographic challenges, and in the words of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, the magnitude of the fiscal gap in the Scottish budget for the foreseeable future. So can I ask the First Minister how he intends to address Scotland's substantial fiscal deficit and whether he now accepts that Kate Forbes was absolutely right when she said that current SNP policies simply wouldn't cut it because there had been a lack of focus on broadening the tax base and on economic growth. First Minister. Tell you what, rejoining the EU would certainly help us in relation to undoing the damage that Brexit has done to businesses up and down uh, the country. Astonishing that Liz, uh, Liz Smith was able to get through that question without mentioning the damage and the impact that Brexit has done to our economy and to businesses right up and down the country. The loss of access to the largest single market in the world, the lack of access to freedom of movement. Talk to any hospitality industry up and down the country and they will tell you just how damaging Brexit has been. What else has been damaging, of course, immigration. Those immigration policies that have been brought forward by her government that works against the economic interest uh, of Scotland. And to extend in Holland Branch, Liz Smith and I have, of course, worked on some of these issues before. We've worked on, for example, a post-study work visa. The UK government rejected that. Mm. Scotland needs to say in the shortage, shortage occupation list, yeah. the UK government have rejected that. Yeah. They should let asylum seekers work and pay tax. Yeah. Uh, if you talk about increasing the tax uh, base, the UK government have rejected uh, that. We want to extend the rural visa pilot. The UK government have rejected that. So we'll do everything in our powers to help the economy, but we're doing it under the constraints of devolution, under the constraints of a Tory government that does not work for the economic interests of Scotland, and we will not be able to make the maximum use or unleash our full potential until we have the powers of a normal, independent nation. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the First Minister to his post. The Fiscal Sustainability Report makes it startly clear 
that without fundamental change, our public finances will be utterly unsustainable. Well, the bulk of the sustainability risk lies with the UK public sector debt expected to rise to 267% of national income. Scotland, due to demographic change and increasing demand, will also have to reprioritise its spending. What steps will the First Minister take to address this direct challenge to our public finances and the crucial services they provide? First Minister. Well, I mean, Kerry Gibson gets it in a nutshell. We are reliant on decisions made by the UK government, and that will impact and inflict damage, as it has often done to our businesses and to our economy. And let me just say, there does not have to be a choice between growing our tax base, our revenue base, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, investing in the wellbeing economy. You can do both. Uh, progressive taxation. You can have progressive taxation. I'm really pleased that we have a legacy of progressive taxation left to us by John Swinney and his role as a former finance secretary. That means that we can invest in our economy, invest that extra billion pounds in our health service, invest in making sure that we have fair work. If we have fair work and that well being economy, then of course that is to the interest not just of the people, but of, of the economy as well. But Kenny Gibson is absolutely right. So as long as the UK government holds the majority of the financial levers in their hands, they will continue to hold this country back. Yeah. Yeah. Ross Greer. Thank you. Following the First Minister's very welcome comments in the Daily Record about the need to redistribute wealth more fairly, can I ask if he will meet with myself and representatives of the Scottish Trade Union Congress to discuss further opportunities for progressive financial reform? First Minister. Like that? Yes, I will. I had a very constructive uh, engagement with the STUC uh, during the leadership uh, contest. I think they've got some excellent ideas on how to increase uh, for example, uh, the uh, revenue uh, and doing that in a way that's fair. And I, I absolutely nail my colours to the mass when it comes to progressive taxation. I think government ministers, MSPs, I think those that earn the most should be paying the most. I make no apology for that. And at the same time, I do believe in growing our economy, not for its own sake, but for making sure we invest in fair work. That is something that every single person in this chamber should be able to get around. So I don't understand why we hear the moaning and groaning from the Conservatives. Well, I do understand because if we'd listened to them, if we'd given tax cuts to the wealthiest, we would have had over half a billion pounds less to invest in our public services. There's no way I'll be doing that. I'll be making sure that those that earn the most pay the most for, uh, to invest in our public services. Question number four, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on the anticipated 1st of April rise in energy bills on household finances in Scotland. First Minister. The reversal of the rise in the energy price guarantee was the least the Chancellor could do this spring, but a progressive government which has, truly has people as their priority, would have done so much more to support households in needs. We called on the Chancellor to extend the £400 energy bill support scheme, but he failed to deliver. And in doing so, he has placed more pressure on vulnerable households struggling to pay their bills and heat their homes. In contrast, my first act as First Minister, uh, 24 hours after being sworn in at the Court of Session, has been not to double, but to triple our fuel insecurity fund last year from £10 million to £30 million in 23-24. This fund is a critical plank in our support to people who are struggling with their energy costs. It continues to provide a lifeline to households who are at risk of self-rationing or self-disconnecting their energy use. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Following the UK budget, OBR forecasts show typical household energy bills are expected to remain in excess of £2,000 until at least winter 2024-25 and possibly beyond. Given this, will the First Minister take this opportunity to urge the UK Government to reverse the incomprehensible decision to scrap the £400 energy bill support scheme, which is leaving many families in my constituency and across Scotland hundreds of pounds worse off? First Minister. Uh, Jackie Dunbar is, of course, uh, absolutely right, and I do uh, join her in urging the UK Government to reconsider the removal of the support scheme that means a typical household's annual bill will increase by around about 19 per cent. As well as removing 50,000 households from fuel poverty, the continuation of the support scheme would have removed 120,000 house households, Scottish households, from extreme fuel poverty. Instead, the UK Government has uh, inexplicably chosen a course which will result in approximately 920,000 fuel-poor households in Scotland. This equates to around 37 per cent 
of all Scottish households, it's unacceptable. And while the Scottish Government is doing everything we can within its limited powers to ensure people receive the help they need, the UK Government could have gone far, uh, could, have gone, could have done far more to ease the burden affecting so many, demonstrating why we need those full powers of independence. It is a scandal, presiding officer, that in energy-rich Scotland, our people are facing fuel poverty because of the actions and indeed the inactions often of the UK government. We must never, ever accept that as the norm or of the as the status quo. Question number five, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the poverty st statistics published last week in the report Poverty and Income Inequality in Scotland 2019 to 2022. First Minister. Uh, poverty levels are lower for all individuals and for children than the UK average, but I, I fully state unequivocally they remain uh, unacceptably high, which is why I want all the powers of a normal nation, such as all social security and all employment powers. Uh, we will continue to use all the levers we have and have allocated almost £3 billion this year to a range of measures to help mitigate against the impacts of the cost of living crisis. Our investment in the Scottish Child Payment, the most ambitious child poverty reduction measure in the UK, is estimated to lift 50,000 children out of relative poverty in 2023-24. Tackling poverty will be the defining mission of my government, which is why I will convene an anti-poverty summit to help guide the choices that I make as First Minister shortly. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But over 15 years, the SNP have squandered Labour's legacy. People are poorer. Relative poverty is up. Poverty amongst disabled people is up. Persistent poverty is up. The best spin the SNP could come Let's up with hear the is, member, that these, please. is that these terrible figures are stable. This First Minister has failed to tackle poverty in Glasgow, where he represents, and in Dundee, where he lives. He's failed to tackle poverty over 10 years as a government minister. He says tackling poverty is his priority, but he's not appointed a minister for social security. So I ask the First Minister, why should people in Scotland trust him to reduce poverty? First Minister. Social Security is being led by the Cabinet Secretary. It's a Cabinet position. Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice. She's sitting right there. She's waving right at you. So it will be a Cabinet responsibility. And here's what we're doing. We are spending £3 billion Thank you, members. to mitigate the harmful effects of Tory austerity. Yeah. Almost £3, mil £3 billion. Pounds. That includes, of course, the game-changing Scottish child payment. We support families in a variety of ways, including free school meals, free bus travel for under 22s, free school meals for around 145,000 pupils. And we have made significant increases, as I've already mentioned, to our food, uh, fuel insecurity, but also our food insecurity fund, as well as the Scottish Welfare Fund. And just to quote, if she doesn't believe me, just to quote uh, John Dickey, known to members right across the chamber of the Child Poverty Action Group, when he said, and I quote, there should be no doubt Nicola Sturgeon has made huge progress putting in place the building blocks needed to end child poverty. And it should be said, the statistics that are being quoted and discussed here, of course, uh, they are from before we increased the Scottish child payment. But let me say really clearly to Pam Duncan Clancy, I didn't get into politics just to mitigate every time, uh, I didn't mitigate every time that the UK government brings forward harmful policies. Every time we do that, we have to take money away from the NHS. We have to take money away from education. We have to take money away from transport. We have to take money away from justice to mitigate the harmful impacts of cruel Tory policies. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better to have the full powers over social security in our hands, the full powers of, over the finances, the full powers over employment, all in our hands, instead of being at the mercy of a UK government? And that's the difference between Pam Duncan Glancy and I. She wants to keep those powers in the hands of the Conservative Party. I want to make sure they're in our hands so we can unleash this country's potential. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Child Payment has not been paid to many of my constituents yet. On uh, Monday, I visited a charity who had been trying to help those individuals and was told, don't even bother contacting Social Security Scotland till next month because we can't make that payment. 
and yet the, the first decision by the first minister was to take away a minister with sole responsibility for social security. Will he look at that again and apologise to all my constituents and to the hundreds of people across Scotland who are still waiting for that money and there's a system that is simply not working? First Minister. Uh, let me say I am, of course, uh, happy to look at individual cases again if Jeremy Balfour wishes to bring them to my attention or indeed the Cabinet Secretary who has responsibility for Social Security, a Cabinet Secretary uh, for Social Justice. We will, uh, of course, look into that. Uh, but let me also say once again, uh, particularly to the Conservative uh, member, I think they are utterly shameless, presiding officer. <laughs> Over a decade of austerity, economic vandalism, which has meant that energy prices are sky high, inflation sky high, a Tory cost of living Thank crisis. You members. They literally took money out of the pockets of those on universal credit yeah. during the pandemic. Let me say to Jeremy Balfour, no one believes his crocodile tears for those that are suffering as a result of Tory cruelty, presiding officer. Question number six, Ariane Burgess. To ask, the first, to ask the First Minister what actions the Scottish Government will take to tackle the climate and nature emergencies. First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to tackling the twin climate and nature crises and ensuring a just transition that creates jobs and economic opportunity across Scotland. I thought we'd had enough interventions, uh, presiding uh, officer. Uh, this is at the heart of the Butte House Agreement between the Scottish Greens and the SNP Government. I look forward very much to working together and indeed uh, across this chamber to deliver the actions that we need. Our top priorities include the, include the development of our next climate change plan, a draft which will be brought to this parliament this November, and taking forward our new biodiversity strategy too. This will ensure that Scotland plays our part in delivering on the goals within the new global biodiversity framework uh, agreed in Montreal in December. Ariane Burgess. I thank the First Minister for that answer. As the UN Secretary General said last week, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. That is the challenge for the new climate plan, and the Scottish Greens are committed to playing our part in ensuring we meet it. That is a climate plan which transforms transport, reshapes land use, radically shifts how we keep our homes warm, and reaps the reward of tens of thousands of green jobs in our new economy. Later today, the First Minister will set out his new cabinet and ministerial team to Parliament. So can he outline how that new team is set up to deliver this, this greatest challenge, the climate challenge. First Minister. I can I thank the member for her question. Let me be absolutely clear that this government, that my government, is committed to tackling the climate emergency. When uh, I spoke to uh, new members of the Cabinet, uh, the junior ministerial team, I made it clear that we must be radical, we must be bold in all areas of government, but particularly in the biggest challenge our planet faces, our humanity faces, and that is, of course, uh, the threat of climate change. It's a priority that runs across the work of all members of my cabinet and my ministerial team, and one that I will take, of course, uh, an interest, a personal interest in uh, myself, because the transition to net zero is not just one of the defining challenges of our time. It's also a huge economic opportunity for Scotland. If we unleash the green potential of this country, uh, we will create tens of thousands of jobs uh, in the decades to come. So I'll work tirelessly to ensure that we grasp that opportunity, creating green jobs and opportunities right across Scotland. I want the northeast of Scotland in particular to be the net zero capital, not just of Europe, but of the world. Colin Smith. The First Minister has been part of a government which the Climate Change Committee point out has missed seven out of 11 of our legal climate targets, including being Minister for the highest emitter of greenhouse gases, transport at a time, to coin a phrase, when the trains didn't run. Why has the government he's been a minister in for more than a decade failed to deliver a credible plan that will even come close to meeting a target of net zero by 2045? A government the Climate Change Committee say will almost certainly miss a target to reduce emissions by 75% by 2030. First Minister. We of course have some of the world leading targets and some of the most ambitious targets in the world. The latest emissions data for 2020 shows that Scotland's emissions are down by over 50% since the 1990 baseline, over halfway to zero. So we continue to be ahead of the UK as a whole in delivering long-term emissions reductions. We're also already making progress, of course, to decarbonise 
our energy systems. In 2020, Scotland generated the equivalent of almost 99% of our gross electricity consumption from new renewable sources. I've already said we will come to this Parliament, uh, of course, with that climate uh, change plan. It will be ambitious. But what I would say to Labour, what doesn't help is if they oppose us at every single turn for every single climate measure we bring for the sake of just opposition. So if Labour, and I say to all of the Chamber, if they are serious about tackling the climate emergency, back us when we take the radical and bold action that's required. Thank you. We will move to general and constituency supplementaries and I call CoCab Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will recall a meeting with myself and representatives of Sports Scotland and Cricket Scotland following the Changing Boundaries report, which found institutional racism within Cricket Scotland itself. Despite being placed under special measures, the working group has made no meaningful progress to date. In fact, it's only met once in seven months. Well-respected uh, EDI advisory board members have resigned and many within the sport have spoken out about their concerns that this issue just isn't being taken seriously and I'm not sure it's a fast-moving situation, who knows what's next. I'm sure the First Minister will agree with me that enough is enough and polished PR from Cricket Scotland just won't cut it and we need action. Will the First Minister commit to calling for an urgent meeting to meet with me, the Chair of Sports Scotland, Cricket Scotland, to discuss this woeful lack of progress and to find a constructive way forward? First Minister. I'm not sure why there was uh, groaning from some benches uh, to my left no, when such an important issue uh, was being raised by CoCab Stewart. And can I pay credit to CoCab Stewart, but also can I importantly pay tribute to many of those cricket uh, players, uh, mm. former and current, mm. who yeah. put their head above the parapet yeah. yeah. to yeah. talk about Absolutely. racism, which is not an easy thing to do. They did that at much personal cost Absolutely. and much professional cost uh, as well. And again, I don't understand why there was chuntering uh, from the Conservative benches to what was a very important exactly. question indeed. Uh, we are clear that there's no place for racism, no place for discrimination in any kind of sport or indeed wider society. I've, of course, in my previous role, uh, had many meetings, a number of meetings, I should say, with Sports Scotland uh, and indeed with Cricket Scotland uh, uh, to discuss this very matter. Uh, my understanding is that there have been robust discussions uh, between Sports Scotland and Cricket Scotland in the last week. Uh, they, are, they have reiterated that all options are being considered as they're held to account. The, the final decision on whether Cricket Scotland exits special measures will be dependent on all recommendations from the Changing the Boundaries report being met in absolute full. We'll continue to engage with Cricket Scotland, of course. Uh, I will ensure that the appropriate minister does meet with CoCab Stewart, and I'll make sure I also uh, make time, because this is an issue that's very close to my heart, uh, to meet with CoCab Stewart to discuss these issues further. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, we heard shocking allegations that Edinburgh University discouraged two students from reporting sex attacks to the police with one student reportedly being told that the university would be unable to support her if she reported this incident to the police. Does the First Minister agree that survivors of sexual assault must fully be supported to report crimes against them? And will, he, will his government commit to a full independent investigation to establish the full facts of this situation and why this is allowed to happen? First Minister. Well, of course, the university is uh, independent uh, of uh, the Scottish Government, but can I say I absolutely agree with Pam Gosso. She has a strong track record of standing up uh, for uh, issues in this uh, regard. Uh, I am uh, very worried uh, and, uh, in fact, frankly, uh, horrified by the situation as she articulates it. I accept I don't know the full detail uh, of that, and perhaps after this session, uh, if Pam Gosso feels she can, if she can furnish me at uh, my office with the full details uh, of that. Uh, in a previous uh, role, when I was Justice Secretary, uh, I was often commending the excellent work work that's been done uh, by Emily's test, by uh, Fiona Drury uh, and uh, her family. Uh, and I hope that every university would sign up uh, to the excellent, uh, the excellent initiative uh, that is uh, Emily's uh, test. So I will consider uh, the actions that Pam Gosso has asked me to consider. Uh, I hope she can furnish me with further details, but I absolutely share her sentiment uh, that uh, anybody who has been a victim of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, uh, they must be fully supported particularly by our universities and colleges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mercedes Vialba. 
In Aberdeen, the SNP has for the second time voted to permanently close six libraries in the city tomorrow. But Aberdonians know that local government has a statutory requirement to provide adequate library facilities to all residents. And we all heard the First Minister's predecessor when she said that the Scottish Government is committed to supporting libraries directly. So will the new First Minister reassure my constituents that he will not stand by and allow our library buildings to close? First Minister. Can I say that I agree with the sentiment of the member's questioner and the importance of our libraries? They're not just important for those who love books, of course, they are important for that sake too, but they provide a number of important facilities, IT facilities, for example, for people that might not have access to broadband. They provide other services, like welfare services can often be provided. Many of us will hold our surgeries in local libraries as members of the Scottish Parliament. So I absolutely agree with the sentiment behind the member's question. We do place great importance on public libraries, believe that everyone should have access to those public libraries. But equally, of course, it is often the case that members across this chamber quite rightly uh, believe, as I do, that decisions uh, for the council, for a local authority, should be made by the local authorities. Aberdeen City Council's plan to close libraries will, of course, be extremely difficult for the library staff and the community. However, we recognise the financial challenges that local authorities are facing. At my policy, and I said this throughout the course of the recent campaign is to work with local government to get a new deal for our local authorities that will allow them even more financial freedom and flexibility. In 23-24, Aberdeen City Council will receive 436.9 million to fund local services. Taken together with the decisions to increase council tax by 5%, they will receive an extra 34.3 million to support vital services. In addition, all local councils will receive their fair share of the current undistributed sum of 329 million. Yep. Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I take this opportunity to welcome the f new First Minister to his seat? I know the First Minister will, like me, have taken great joy in watching Scotland's men's team triumph over Spain at Hamden on Tuesday in a famous victory. He will also be aware that, unlike fans in England and Wales, viewers here do not have access to watch the men's national team on a free, uh, free to view TV. Can I therefore ask what, if any, engagement has taken place with broadcasting providers about showing these football matches on free to air TV? And does he agree with me that increased access to games like that on Tuesday will help inspire the next generation of footballers? First Minister. I, I, for some reason, heard Jackie Bailey shout, oh, seriously, I thought we would all get behind the national team for a phenomenal result yeah. uh, just, the other, just the other day. Exactly. Even, exactly. even. Even the ray of sunshine that is Jackie Bailey must be able to get behind the Scottish football team. I noticed after that result there was some calls uh, to put Steve Clark in the cabinet, but I think he'll do an even better job uh, currently uh, where he is. Look, I couldn't be clearer. Fulton McGregor uh, makes a really important point. I, I, I couldn't be clearer. Men's, uh, women and men's Scottish football international matches, uh, both in the men's game and the women's game, should be part, uh, for me, of the crown jewels of free-to-air sporting events but sadly of course the UK government we know have failed to act. We'll continue to press the UK government to expand the listed uh, events regime uh, but it would be far simpler of course as I've said already if those powers rested in this parliament. So we'll work with the Scottish FA to continue to make football more accessible to all across society. Fantastic performances like we saw on Tuesday night not only to put a smile on the faces of the nation, but I hope what they can do is really inspire people of all ages, young and not so young, to get active and kick a ball around. Yeah, yeah. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, I think the breaking of glass was not a good omen for this new First Minister. I recently met with campaigners from endometriosis south of Scotland. All three spoke of their own experience. All three in unbearable pain, having to go private to get a diagnosis. This is typical of women across Scotland who face up to eight years for a diagnosis. And it was revealed on Sunday that the Scottish Government's endometriosis advisory group has not met since April 2022. Does the First Minister agree that this is an insult to the 100,000 women suffering with unbearable pain across Scotland? And will he uh, commit to ensuring that this group meet? First Minister. 
What I would say to Rachel Hamilton is that she raises an exceptionally important uh, point. Of course, I was involved in this work uh, in my role as Health Secretary, and of course, Marie Todd, in her previous role, uh, took forward much of this action as the Minister with Responsibility for Women's Health. And uh, I've met a number of organisations uh, who, who, of course, represent uh, women who have been particularly affected by endometriosis. And uh, Rachel Hamilton is absolutely right that uh, far too many women wait far too long for that life-changing di uh, diagnosis. Uh, so we have the Women's Health Plan, of course, which is committed to taking forward some of this work. Uh, I will happily look uh, at the meeting uh, of the group, uh, as Rachel Hamilton rightly uh, highlights, uh, and see what further progress we can make. And I'll write to the member uh, with an update. And Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware it's over two years now we've waited for the UNCRC bill to come back to this chamber um, to be remedied. During that time, there has been changing government narrative about why the UNCRC bill has not come back to this chamber. So, can the First Minister um, undertake that the bill will return to this chamber before summer recess? Or if he can't, will the government publish the correspondence and what is causing the hold-up between the Scottish Government and the UK Government? First Minister. I have to say, once again, I don't disagree, actually, with the sentiment behind Martin Whitfield's really important question. We wanted to make sure those rights were incorporated uh, into our legislation because we want to do the best uh, by our children and by our young people. We know the action that the UK Government uh, chose uh, to take. Uh, so we are continuing to liaise with the UK Government. Uh, I will uh, see what can be published in relation uh, to those discussions. But as soon as we have some sort of agreement on the way forward, I will make sure that we make progress on this, because there's nothing more important than the rights of our young people. I say that as the father uh, of two children uh, myself. So uh, I will absolutely look uh, at his request, his request to see what can be published. Uh, but I can give him an absolute promise. There is no shortage of intent, nor pace, nor urgency uh, from the government that I lead. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. I would just like to say at this point, colleagues, that I deeply regret that due to the completely unacceptable interruptions that we've experienced today, I'm unable to call any more members to put questions to the First Minister on matters of importance to the people that they represent. And I would like again to apologise to those visitors who travelled here in good faith, often at great inconvenience, to watch their representatives at work. Please rest assured that I will review and escalate measures as required to counter the actions of a small minority who seek to disrupt our work. And I have no doubt that all members share my determination that our democratically elected parliament will continue to do its vital work on behalf of the people of Scotland. Thank you. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item. I suspend this meeting.